Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Nearly half of all cancer cases are believed to be preventable. And more and more research points to a healthy diet as a major factor in cancer prevention. A nutrient-rich diet can improve our health in numerous ways, but can also be overwhelming to change our eating habits. Hi, I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, and I'm here with Dr. Jill Hamilton Reeves, a dietitian and certified oncology nutritionist at KU Cancer Center is with me here to help explain the connection between nutrition and cancer prevention, as well as provide useful tips for healthy eating. First, is there such a thing as a cancer-fighting food? Well, that's kind of a trick question. Um, if we added an S to the end of that, so there are foods that are cancer-fighting, but um, any single food or single nutrient is likely not going to do the job. Um, I'll be talking today about several different ideas, um, and a lot of these um, ideas come from scouring of the evidence and, um, and being summarized on a website, um, American Institute for Cancer Research, mm -hmm. so I don't know if we can put that in some of the show notes so that people can go and look at certain foods in particular, um, but there's, there's a long list of them, and essentially all of them are um, wholesome plant based foods, so, you know, berries, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, probably not any surprises. Yeah. So what is your advice for reducing cancer risk uh, through diet and food? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and really focusing on the nutrition aspect, um, there are about 13 cancers, 12 to 13 cancers, depending on which data you look at, that are associated with um, obesity. And so um, it's not necessarily the, the weight on the scale that matters as much as the metabolic health of the person and, um, and the types of foods and the way that they're taking care of themselves. So one of the top things that we can do to prevent cancer is to be as healthy as possible, try to be you know, a healthy body weight for you. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily letting the scale tell you what that is, but um, most people kind of know where they feel good. Um, and uh, and then eating diet uh, that is full of plant-based foods, uh, like I mentioned, um, fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, um, some healthy proteins. Uh, those are those are the recommendations. And then, you know. It, there's not a lot of uh, conversations about nutrition until it kind of goes south to, well, what am I not supposed to eat? Mm -hmm. There's all these uh, guilt types of messages of, of different foods. Um, and, and I don't want people to leave with that kind of fear mongering. Um, there are some messages out there that I think are helpful as far as moderation. So um, consuming you know, less uh, red meat, less processed meat, um, not a lot of alcohol, if any, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. So sugar is a very hot topic yeah, these sure days. Is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, just cut right to the chase. Does too much sugar increase your risk of cancer? So uh, you, you're cutting to the chase, and I'm going to dance around it a little okay. bit. How about that? <laughs> so uh, the story with sugar is that um, it kind of goes into that idea of people being their healthiest. Uh, uh, body composition and body weight. Uh, when we drink uh, beverages that have a lot of sugar in them, our brains don't really understand that that's calories and extra energy. And so a lot of times, um, as a society, we drink so many calories and don't feel full and end up gaining extra weight. And so through that kind of indirect way, um, you could say, you know, consuming too much sugar creates an environment and an healthy body that um, is more likely to develop cancer. But you see how loosely mm -hmm. that's all connected? Yeah. Um, there's also the issue that when blood sugar increases, um, insulin increases. So that's a hormone in the body that's meant to control our, our blood sugar. And there's quite a few cancers that are associated with um, with out of control blood sugar. So uh, people that have diabetes or a condition of pre-diabetes, just meaning that their insulin runs a little high and their sugar runs a little high. And, um, and that 
metabolic state is also um, increasing the risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I think people get the idea that sugar uh, feeds cancer. Um, there's some cell culture studies that look at you know different levels of sugar on um, tumor uh, uh, tissue, and uh, and cancer likes energy. So whatever energy you give cancer um, cells, it's going to use it mm -hmm. and figure out how to survive. Hmm. Does that answer your question that, without dancing that's, around that's it too much? That's pretty good. You, you, you did a good job. <laughs> uh, you're, you're ready for your congressional hearing, I would oh, say. Oh, okay, yeah. great, great. <laughs> so, so if you're uh, just joining us, we're here with Dr. Jill Hamilton-Reeves talking about nutrition and cancer prevention. And Megan Peters is here in the studio to take your questions. Remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. So let's talk about uh, cancer survivors. Um, mm -hmm. What are their unique nutritional needs? Um, well, it kind of depends on what kind of treatment those cancer survivors went through. Um, to, let's zoom out really wide for the big picture. Um, so when we think about uh, public health messages, the lifestyle recommendations to prevent a second cancer um, or the recurrence of cancer are the same for cancer survivors as they are for um, prevention of cancer. So again, if um, we put in the show notes that website that I was mentioning, people can look at those uh, the list of those recommendations and what applies for cancer prevention applies for cancer survivorship. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in being at a medical center and working with people that have undergone some pretty extensive treatments, you and I both know that mm -hmm. some of those treatments change people's lives forever. So um, sometimes people have a resection of their bowel and they need to change their, um, their diets because of that or had neck cancer. Um, there are certain foods that they can't eat mm -hmm. anymore. And so I just strongly recommend that if people have had treatments that affect the way that they eat, that they do work with um, a licensed nutritionist to um, to really brainstorm ways that they can still get a lot of um, nutrient dense nourishing food um, to restore their their muscle mass and um, and heal and recover after treatment hmm. so um, y your research involves uh, nutrition obviously and and what's the relationship between nutrition and cancer prevention and, and survivorship maybe you could Give us a little window into uh, what what your lab focuses on. Okay, so what our lab does. Um, so the projects I lead are the mm -hmm. ones that I help with. Okay, yep. either one. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so the last time that I was on uh, last month, we talked a little bit about the uh, prostate cancer study that mm -hmm. we're doing. So that's uh, in men that have. Um, they have local prostate cancer and they're having their prostate removed for treatment. And, uh, and there's data suggesting that increased adiposity, um, body fatness, increases the risk of prostate cancer progression as well as the cancer coming back. So we have a study where we're helping guys lose weight before their treatment. Mm. And, then, um, and then after treatment or after the surgery, we really go into like the lifestyle of like changing habits um, and, uh, and how they're going to sustain that weight loss over time. And, uh, and the, what we're really interested in is, you know, there's that relationship that with increasing adiposity is increasing risk. It makes sense to ask, well, then mm -hmm. does decreasing adiposity right. decrease risk? Yep. Um, but we're really trying to get into the black box and look at the mechanisms. So we're not only looking at the prostate tissue itself that has the tumor and the normal um, cells in it, but we're looking at, there's a layer of fat around the prostate. And, um, and we think uh, there are some signals that that the, um, the fat is communicating with the tumor that is helping uh, cancer escape that primary environment and seed elsewhere. Hmm. So um, that's really what we're kind of digging into. Oh. Um, so that's really more of a survivorship, maybe um, prevention of secondary cancer. Um, in the same kind of uh, thought in thinking of a primary prevention, one of the things that we discovered in um, our early pilot study was that um, we had some participants um, that are uh, African American, and when we looked at their uh, the biology of their tumors and the inflammatory environment of their tumors, they were drastically different than um, than our men of uh, European heritage, mm -hmm. and um, and it was striking. It was very striking. Um, turns out, in the evidence, there's there's other people that have seen some 
similar things. Um, and uh, and really, I think the, the part that is the, the bigger picture is that um, African American men have higher risk of prostate cancer. They also have higher risk of uh, diabetes and heart mm -hmm. disease. And I think there are so many socioeconomic um, status and um, health determinants that are affecting the, the health of, of our men. And so we're working with some of the African American communities to talk about health, um, to talk about uh, ways that we can reduce barriers to physical activity, to um, access to healthy foods, food security, and um, deal with trauma and stress. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really prevention, early, sure. early stage. Yeah. So that's each side of the spectrum, I suppose. Well, as is always the case when, when you're on, uh, your comments are uh, eliciting a, a variety of questions. And so, oh, Megan, great. maybe uh, we could start uh, with some of the questions. Sure. So the first question is, what is the healthiest way to prepare fruits and vegetables for consumption? The healthiest way is to get them into your house <laughs> and pack them with you when you go places. So um, some foods are uh, healthier when they're consumed raw. Some are you release nutrients as you cook them. I think that um, you know there's sometimes I, I think there's a, a phrase that uh, perfection is the the frenemy or the <laughs> the evil and uh, the nemesis of good. Um, I I don't think that people really need to focus a lot on uh, whether it's cold, um, room temperature, cooked, or how it's cooked. I, I will say there are extremes. So um, you know uh, so, so where you I grew want, up. So you don't want me to deep fat fry an orange yeah. and call that healthy? Is that right? Right. So okay. that is kind of taking a healthy food and and yeah. um, you know maybe muddying it up a little bit um, and then overcooking things so that they don't taste very good and sometimes the nutrients are, are lost that's also not very fun but anywhere in the in the middle I think you'll be just fine just get those fruits and vegetables okay yeah. great the second question I have is how important is it to buy organic food and which ones should you buy that is a great question. So um, again, kind of zooming out to the big picture, um, eating fruits and vegetables is more important than thinking about whether it's organic or not organic. Um, so I just don't, I want to make sure that people that are listening to uh, today's um, uh, video that uh, they don't leave thinking that they have to spend a lot of money on organic produce. Um, there are some fruits and vegetables that tend to hold on to um, pesticides and herbicides a little bit um, stronger. Um, and so uh, there's there's uh, lists available on the internet of what we refer to as like the dirty dozen. Um, but I think that there's a lot more awareness now in farming practices that even our conventional farmers um, are, are being uh, a lot more careful about um, what we're putting on our food supply and, and how it's getting to the market. So um, again, I don't want people to be held up by the price of organic or not organic. I do think that in general, um, if we're thinking about sustainability and, um, and the earth and all of those types of things, choosing to buy organic is, is somewhat a vote of we want this to be a priority of farmers, to think about reducing um, chemicals uh, on our foods. Um, but I don't, I don't think that it should be a barrier to people eating fruits and vegetables. Okay. Okay. Um, does a high fiber diet prevent cancer? And if so, what are good sources for fiber? That's a great question. So you got a bunch of ringers out there. Today. I know these are fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ring them. Um, so high fiber diet uh, is uh, most associated with reducing the risk of colon cancer. Um, too bad we don't have our big inflatable colon to you know use as a visual aid. Um, <laughs> so uh, and the reason for that is that um, when we consume more fiber in the diet, then typically that speeds up the transit of food through the gut. Um, and so it kind of think about being like a sponge or a scrub brush like through through your gut. Um, and so uh, as far as the types of foods that are high in fiber, well, no big surprise. It's the foods that we've been talking about today are mm -hmm. fruit vegetables, uh, whole grains, and legumes are excellent sources of, of fiber. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so there's a website that you've referenced a couple times uh -huh. with a list of foods. Could you repeat that for our audience? Yeah. Um, so to find the, the website, it's AICR.org, and that's the American Institute for Cancer Research. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have found I have an ATM defect, so I'm trying to be aware of my lifestyle, and this person just wanted to say thank you. Oh. Um, and then another question, should you support your diet with a multivitamin? 
Ooh, great question. Um, so. Uh, but supplements, I mean, just as far as having a simple message, um, vitamin and mineral supplements won't prevent cancer. Um, we've been trying to study different nutrients um, individually over the past few years. We've learned some tough lessons in nutrition science with that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not saying that a multivitamin uh, isn't uh, helpful to some people. I do think having a conversation with your healthcare provider, um, and even better if you can work with a nutritionist or a dietitian. Uh, to uh, to think about what nutrients actually make sense for you. Uh, the field has really moved away from thinking of a vitamin mineral as being like, I think back when I started in the field, it was kind of thought of as like life insurance, you know, that you would take this mm -hmm. and this would cover all your faults. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're, we're really doing a lot more with monitoring and then, um, and then dosing. So, you know, vitamin D, for instance, is something that uh, we won't be synthesizing from now until April here in Kansas City because the wavelength of the sun is not strong enough to um, to produce vitamin D on our skin. So um, it's kind of challenging to eat enough vitamin D. So most people probably need to check their vitamin D levels and see if they uh, should take some supplements in order to um, get their vitamin D back into optimal range. Mm -hmm. So what emerging uh, research are you most excited about? Okay, um, wow, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, I think some of the things that we're talking about here, um, we've had some early brainstorms about um, really getting access to a uh, special population. So I'm, I mentioned uh, some of the work here uh, that we're starting in Wyandotte County um, that I'm super excited about. I'm also really excited, uh, Dr. Buffer and Dr. Klimp mm -hmm. um, and, and I are uh, talking about getting some uh, rural interventions together and, um, and really reaching across Kansas and, um, and Missouri and perhaps even Iowa um, to really target those cancers that are associated with obesity um, and um, and bring cancer survivors together in communities um, in order to um, help optimize their health in an area where um, I, I really like the phrase it's uh, relationship rich and maybe resource poor mm -hmm. and um, and the really leveraging the strength of having relationships to um, and community for people to be accountable to healthy behaviors and kind of normalize that in rural communities mm -hmm. I think that's super exciting so um, I really hope that catches some momentum and we're able to do that work that sounds great so so I'm gonna put you on the spot oh okay okay oh. Um, um, I think our audience would like to know what does your diet look like. Oh, you are. Pretty Notice I didn't spot. like. I didn't let you ask me that question. Uh, oh, oh, maybe we could flip no. the. <laughs> no. I think the audience might be interested. I, no, we're, we're gonna go. With you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, what does my diet look like? Um, yeah, I. There are certain foods that I think um, I almost always have on hand, and um, and it's not necessarily that you know I'm voting these to be the most important. They're just things that I, I really enjoy. So I almost always have spinach, and I have um, I have soy milk in my latte in the morning. I drink a lot of hot tea. I love sweet potatoes. I like salmon, berries. I mean, this is sounding like I'm ordering at the restaurant, um, uh, and. I really like to try to eat foods that are seasonal. So right now, um, being the fall, I'm eating more apples, more canned pumpkin, um, you know, kind of those those fall flavors. Oh, cranberries! Oh my gosh, I love cranberries and cranberry sauce. My kids think that's they think that's so weird. Um, so those are those are the main things. I don't know if that answers your question mm -hmm. as far as what that looks like. Um, I know that uh, at least with our participants. It seems like people um, that aren't eating a diet that um, makes them feel good, the barriers are usually that they have a lack of awareness or lack mm -hmm. of knowledge um, of nutrition, or they're so judgmental about themselves that they get in their own way. Um, and so um, anyway, I think that's, so I don't want anyone to hear my list and somehow judge uh, what, by measuring up what they, what they eat, but um, I really think about foods and things that I can throw into my bag and bring to work and it's super easy or um, uh, assemble together at home without a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Efficiency is kind of important to me. Yeah. 
So are there any other favorite nutrient-rich foods that you wanted to make sure and mention, or I um, think we covered it? You know, uh, are, uh, do you have some in mind? Maybe you have some favorites you'd like to share. Uh, I like frozen blueberries. Oh my gosh, they are so good. Yeah. And you like to eat them frozen? Absolutely. That? Oh, that's interesting. Yep. And how did you stumble upon this? Uh, I have to attribute that to my son. Oh, he puts nice. them on a cereal. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and then they kind of get like that milky layer on the outside yes. that's so good. Milk yeah. Ice, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, we have uh, is we have a couple question. more questions. Okay. Um, this one is: How important are antioxidants in a diet to prevent cancer? Um, so antioxidants to prevent cancer. There's uh, so for people that are listening that are like, what in the world are antioxidants? So um, antioxidants when we when we produce energy inside our bodies, um, we uh, uh, through the energy production there is some oxygen that is left uh, with electrons that are unpaired, and um, and those unpaired electrons like to um, buddy up with others, and uh, and they can create what we call oxidative uh, stress. And so um, for years it was thought that this oxidative stress is what makes people look like prematurely old. Um, it, it can be damaging to cells. Um, as far as whether or not consuming antioxidants can actually prevent cancer, I haven't seen anything super compelling that that's the case. Um, that's not saying that antioxidants don't have their purpose. Um, so antioxidants in our diet, if we think about vitamin C, vitamin A, and vitamin an E, um, it's, it spells a very lovely acronym, ACE, right? Um, so uh, those are those are the nutrients that we think of mostly as having antioxidant potential, which is great for health, but I wouldn't necessarily consume them thinking that, that I'm going to hang my hat on preventing cancer with them. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, getting close uh, to the end of today's uh, uh, episode. What are some of the key takeaways you'd like for our audience uh, to have? So. I noticed in the introduction that you mentioned it might be overwhelming to change our eating habits. Um, and I don't want to read too far into that statement, um, but I've, I've sat with several people that um, that do have some of that kind of paralysis of where do I start. Mm. And, um, and so the take home message I really have is that small changes matter. Um, so, you know, your frozen blueberries, that's beautiful. I love that. I hope people take that and they go put frozen blueberries on their cereal inspired by your son. Um, I, I also think that um, thinking about the systems around us and, and, uh, and habits, so uh, creating rituals and small changes that will really add up to uh, a big difference once time goes by. So thinking about surrounding oneself with other people that prioritize their health um, and thinking about the foods that you bring into your home so that the pull to the healthier foods is uh, the strongest rather than bringing in foods that kind of self-sabotage mm -hmm. that might pull you. Um, I'm, again, I'm not saying that foods are bad, but as far as thinking about the um, the types of foods that that uh, are going to fuel and sustain you, uh, I think that's helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to put my Baptist preacher's hat on now. Oh, please you do. Say, yes, <laughs> which the, the motto of a Baptist preacher is "Don't do as I do, do as I say." Right? <laughs> so um, I, I think actually dieting begins in the grocery store. Mm. And it shouldn't come as a big surprise if you know if you buy a dozen apple fritters, uh, you're probably going to eat a dozen apple fritters over the next week. Mm. So it's like, don't do that, and <laughs> and, uh, and you know, don't shop when you're hungry, and uh, you know, get a list of things that you think are are really going to help uh, improve your diet, and 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 stick to those, and and try not to uh, get distracted by um, the foods that are. Um, you know, just not, uh, they're prepared in a way to have you overeat. And, and there was a great article about that actually yeah. in the last couple of weeks uh, from, from KU researchers and, mm -hmm. and Deborah Sullivan. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I think that's, a, that's an important message. Yeah, I agree. Any additional questions, Megan? I have one more. Um, anything to help in terms of diet with fatty liver? Ooh, yeah. Um, 
So the main thing is thinking about um, if a person consumes alcohol to avoid alcohol, um, mm -hmm. because uh, that would definitely contribute to worsening a fatty liver. Um, there's some interesting data about uh, fish oil being helpful um, for reducing fatty liver. And then um, if someone is overweight, um, the uh, you know, making lifestyle changes to address that uh, can also be helpful. Mm -hmm. Great question. All right. Well, thank you, yeah. uh, Dr. Hamilton Reeves. That's uh, all for today. To learn more about nutrition and cancer, visit KUCancerCenter.org forward slash nutrition. And join us next week at 10 a.m. for Bench to Bedside. Thanks for watching.